Uh, we're going to talk about money for a little bit and and uh, and and doing well. You know, the the history of the last I don't know maybe 20 years has been about walls coming down after thousands of years of walls being put up. I mean, walls uh, between East and West, between autocrats and citizens in the Middle East. It's going on right now. Walls between Warren and Bill. Uh, walls between women in power. And uh, but we're going to talk about is this this wall coming down between money for good and money for more, for, to make more money, so financial capital and social capital. Uh, so the first question uh, for, I guess, Cheryl, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, what kind of are the hallmarks of social venture? What, when you ass assess an investment to make, um, how is it different and how is it the same from your understanding of what these other gentlemen do here? Sure. Um, I I'm going to posit that maybe a lot of people don't know Echoing Green in the audience. We're essentially angel investors in the social sector. So for the past 25 years, we've been, been providing seed capital and support to some of the world's best emerging social entrepreneurs. So Bruce mentioned um, social entrepreneurs like Wendy Cobb. We were early funders of folks like um, the founders of City or uh, Freelancers Union, SKS Microfinance, and 500 plus other young people who were working on tough social problems around the world. Um, but as angel investors, we invest in the human capital. So our paradigm, our calculus, is all about investing in that talent. And we have a very particular prism through which we um, put down on the table the most patient of capital. So when Equine Green invested in Wendy, she had just graduated from Princeton with her senior thesis in hand about how do you start an urban teacher's corps um, to work on the achievement gap in this country. How do you talk about sort of the long-term returns on that? It was about the human um, talent and the human capital. And that's the lens through which we continue to look at um, the work that we do. Every year we launch a global business plan competition. For example, last year we got 3,500 social business plans from young people from 128 countries around the world. And at the point at which we intervene, which is truly post friends and family round, we're looking to invest in that leader. I mean, Jim, uh, is, it, is it the same, do you think? Uh, I mean, you, obviously you picked, you're betting on the person. But why doesn't the, how often or why not does the idea of doing good for society come into the play when you're assessing an investment? Well, in our case, uh, I think the big difference is cultural as opposed to for profit versus nonprofit. Uh, Ten years ago, we had one office, Palo Alto, California. We had seven partners. And today, we have 40 partners worldwide. We have more partners in Beijing and Shanghai than we do in Palo Alto. We have 11 partners in Beijing and Shanghai, seven in Palo Alto. Uh, we have an office here in New York, an office in Bangalore, and an office in London. And for us, the characteristics of an entrepreneur, uh, be it a social entrepreneur or a for-profit, more classic entrepreneur, are extraordinarily similar. In fact, uh, people often ask, how do you spend time with large companies like, and entrepreneurs like Michael Dell uh, or the Walton family? The next day, Mark and I are uh, headed to Menlo Park and spending time with 21-year-old and 22-year-old entrepreneurs at Facebook. The similarities are striking. There's a, there is a secret sauce, uh, be that entrepreneur in the halls of Stanford University or in Greater Beijing, Bangalore, whether that entrepreneur is trying to develop the great next mobile social application that will scale, uh, or trying to reinvent education, as many are, where there are no stock options, there is no stock, but there are 30 passionate engineers and developers at Khan Academy who are as competent, committed as any entrepreneurs in the world. Uh, what I'd emphasize the enduring characteristics of coachability, empowerment, entrepreneurs thinking about is the prosperity that may develop legitimately shared? Does the company scale? These are all the characteristics that at least we see around the world in the very best social entrepreneurs, uh, the very best venture philanthropists, the very best venture capitalists, and the very best for-profit entrepreneurs. The similarities are rather striking. Right. Just taking a step back, I mean, you've written a book about the good capitalism. What was the title? It was Compassionate Capitalism? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about what goes on at Salesforce and, and, and kind of 
how these things all mush together about the, about the, for employees, for you, and the communities you serve? Yeah, uh, well, from the business uh, uh, side of uh, philanthropy, when we started Salesforce.com, which was about 13 years ago now, we took 1% uh, of our equity, 1% uh, of our profit, and 1% of all of our employees' time and put it into a 501c3 public charity. That was extremely easy for us because we had no employees, we had no profit, we had no equity. Uh, so, um, however, today, 13 years later, we have about, we'll soon have about 10,000 employees. We um, will do about $3 billion in revenue this year, or over $3 billion in revenue. Uh, and we, because of that, have been able to give away so far uh, over $30 million uh, to a wide variety of nonprofits and NGOs and social entrepreneurs that we work with. We'll give away $100 million over the next five years, additional $100 million. We have, um, we'll deliver 60,000 days of volunteerism and mentorship this year uh, through our employees. And we run about 15,000 nonprofits and NGOs on our cloud services for free. Uh, many of the entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs uh, that you may know, they run their programs uh, on uh, Salesforce, and we've been fortunate to be able to, to work with many of them. And what I kind of love about this is that it's this concept of really uh, integrated philanthropy that uh, the business and the philanthropy, there is really fundamentally no difference. We have 100 dedicated full-time employees in that foundation now that are doing this work all over the world. And it is a fundamental part of how we run our business. Uh, the first day of employment for uh, each and every one of our employees, in the morning they're doing their orientation, in the afternoon they're doing uh, service. Mark A. So, so the Facebook, I mean, both of you guys are on Facebook, but um, it's, you, the reason you put money in there is not because Facebook can, can have a social impact on the world, I presume. I mean, that may end up being, they may end up being having more economic impact than, than with their advertising model, but um, do, you, do you look for that as a, as a hallmark of an investment, whether it's an Airbnb or, or Facebook? Many of the most successful companies, I think through history, and certainly many of the most com successful companies in the tech industry, have not just been started to make money, uh, but have been started to achieve some kind of larger purpose, right? So Mark Zuckerberg talks a lot about the mission of Facebook is not to make money, the mission is to connect the world. Um, and along the way, there is a lot of money to be made, but there is a larger mission. That mission obviously applies in many areas other than advertising, applies in many areas other than, than just making money. For example, Facebook has become a major engine for nonprofits to be able to connect to their funders and to, their, you know, to, to all the different constituents. Right. Um, and so the larger purpose, the larger agenda, the, the sort of moral energy behind a company, I think, can be extremely motivating. And, and, and maybe I'm wrong on the first point. Maybe this is a great structure within which to do that. Jim, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I think that uh, where we are, we, we co-invest very frequently, and Mark has been a phenomenal partner and friend uh, over the years. So we agree on most everything, which, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I underline most in this particular case. Uh, f for us, uh, and I mentioned it's cultural, so China will not have the same scorecard. A new Chinese startup investment in mobile communications or education will not have the same social scorecard that we would use here. But certainly in all the investments that I personally champion, uh, and all the boards that I'm on, public or private, uh, I do believe that in addition to a very significant scaling, profitable business, uh, there has to be a measurable scorecard. And depending on the business, that scorecard becomes part of the compensation, that scorecard in terms of the social good becomes very much part of who gets hired, what does next generation leadership look like, and certainly the compensation committee plays a very significant role in applying that. God knows we're not perfect, and there's always something to improve. Mm -hmm. But around these scorecards, I think companies become better, they financially become better performers, and in the cases of Facebook, or in the cases of many of our education startups that we're doing today, some are for-profit, some are social enterprise-oriented, 
but today's best entrepreneurs are not thinking about a 10 or 20 year career at one company. They're thinking about five to 10 years, build something of impact, and at least what they're telling us is, we're going to go off and do something completely different, entrepreneurial, and if we start with a for-profit idea, the goal is next time around, it's very likely to be something to do with social entrepreneurship. If we start with a for-profit education company, five to 10 years from now, we want to uh, displace the sage on stage model of lecturing and do something on a completely nonprofit basis in education. That mix and that constant movement between the for-profit and the nonprofit sector, to me, is extremely powerful.